coffee talk number six or something like that in our series. Um, we've taken to offering one of these events a week to talk about retention or to talk about a current event that's happening. Sometimes it's related to COVID-19. Other times we're trying to talk about how do we respond to the situation we're facing in because of COVID-19. So last week, uh, we talked about, with our leadership, the opportunity, um, J.D. Strong, Director of Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, um, Nick Wiley, Chief Conservation Officer of Ducks Unlimited, and Joe Bartosi, President and CEO of National Shooting Sports Foundation, all joined together to iterate to us that there is an opportunity right now for our three efforts. Uh, what we've realized is that people are heading outdoors, perhaps at higher rates than we've ever seen. And we've had lots of conversations about, you know, increased interest in hunter education, um, increased license sales in certain states. We know that each state is in a different status of regulations and seasons being open and, and government um, rules. So we don't want to necessarily focus this conversation we're about to have on you know, what is possible and what is not. But we do want to start to think about if we're seeing a surge in interest in the outdoors, what can we do to retain that interest moving forward? Again, we can't control what's going to happen and what regulations can be put forward. But what we've learned through all of this and working together is that we can work with our agency and our colleagues and partners to, in how we respond to the increased interest. Um, a great example of this has been the social distancing hashtag and uh, responsible recreation that's been outside um, and been promoted by conservation nonprofits, by the uh, state and federal government, and by a lot of our industry partners too. So there is some common things we can do. And as Kristen and I sat down and tried to lay out what we would like to chat and what the goal of this conversation would be, is that at the end of the day, when we walk away from this conversation, we're thinking about ways to retain those new people or increased interested parties for future participation and less about trying to figure out why they got there in the first place. We just want to keep them here. And we know that they're coming and we want to keep them active. So what we've done today is we did a little bit of work ahead of time. We engaged a couple of our partners to be ready. Uh, to share some of their opinions. Um, we, we put some discussion topics. You can see in the notes on the bottom left-hand corner. And then we created a couple pods um, just to kind of get some pull from everybody. Uh, if you could take some time and tell us how has your organization approached retention efforts. And if you work for a state fish and wildlife agency, do you know the turn of your license buyers? Um, these are all key topics that we want to chat about. So I'm going to throw it out there to start with. And, um, what we'll do, uh, just do a rule point real quick, uh, make sure you're either raising your hand, which you can do in the top bar, look, I'm raising my hand right now, or type your question or comment down in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, if you do want to share your thoughts verbally, I'm going to enter the phone number here. Just remember good um, community engagement. We'll call on you guys as we can, and we'll try to manage and facilitate the conversation so people don't talk over each other. Okay. So here are the numbers to call in, 124-329-3655, in case you want to share your ideas too. Okay, so to start off, like I was saying, um, as, we, as the National Hunting and Shooting Sports Action Plan was being written by partners and uh, the Council, Wildlife Management Institute, and a lot of our PR3 partners at the time, what we started to realize was there was a ton of work done on the recruitment side but not much work done on the retention side. Uh, we're really good at getting those first experiences out there. Uh, first time events, first time programs, but what we haven't spent much time on is retention. And a great visualization for this, if you want to talk about this concept with your partners and if you're the archery coordinator leading your agency strategies, um, is to map your programs on the ORAM. As you start to think about the recruit, the retain, the reactivate, um, segments, you can get awareness, interest, trial, and recruitment, and a lot of our efforts fall in there. But then retention, continuation with support, continuation without support, you fall there. So at the end of this session, perhaps you have a couple more strategies that you can put into the retention side of it. Um, so we're talking about current events right now and current efforts. 
And one of the people I reached out to to bring some perspective to the conversation was Mitch Strobel from Calcomy. Um, we've been getting a lot of inquiries. We've seen some great case studies uh, of people in different states um, shifting their uh, hunter education requirements just for the time being or perhaps permanently, depending on the state that you're working in. Um, some launching online courses right away and others getting the first online course in existence in their state up and running. Um, many, we've heard from Montana, we've heard from uh, New York. I know Olivia Dangler in Kentucky has been dealing with this. And so we wanted to reach out to some of our partners that work on the hunter education side and give us a perspective of what's going on in hunter education. Is there truly a surge in interest? Um, and what changes might we take advantage of while that's going on? So um, Mitch, are you available to share some thoughts? Yeah, can everybody hear me okay? We can. Good deal, good deal. Uh, so appreciate the opportunity to chime in here a bit, Sam. Um, have many, many notes that we could share, but kind of out of respect for time, just wanted to go through a few highlights. From them. Uh, the first thing that I was going to add is just related to uh, kind of the subject of retention and the way that we think about it. Uh, couldn't really have predicted the past few months. I don't think any of us could have, but uh, one thing that we've really seen is a, an increase in the conversion to our 101 courses. So I think everybody's aware that we've launched, you know, with our partners, QDMA and NWTF, you know, Turkey 101, Deer 101. If you compare the interest in those courses from a you know, conversion rate perspective, we've seen an increase during COVID. Um, and I think that's just because people are at home looking probably for some things to do. Um, so that, that's been pretty compelling for us, and that's something that we're really starting to look at and focus on more 101 or continued education classes just as a, a retention effort. Um, but Sam, back to your point kind of on, on basic, you know, state required hunter safety, uh, just at a high level, we've seen about 19 states implement some kind of change related to, you know, hunter education. And that's going to range, you know, anywhere from lowering the minimum age. You know, Pennsylvania was the first state to kind of act on this. In fact, um, I think they lowered, lowered the age of the uh, eligibility from their course down to 11, I believe. It's kind of hard to keep all of this straight, but you know what that allowed them to do is when they couldn't, um, unfortunately, couldn't host in-person classes, um, it allowed those students a means to get certified. Um, and kind of soon after, you know, we saw states Idaho, Washington, North Carolina, kind of a, a slew of states come through approving a temporary online-only exemption. Um, and then you have other scenarios like, you know, North Dakota right now, where they're basically saying, take this online course, um, it's going to allow you to have a temporary certificate, and then you need to come take your field day in the summer or the fall, right? So the, the temporary online only certification is something that a lot of states um, have been doing. Um, couple, you know, just a couple case studies here. I know that New York, I saw put out a uh, tweet, I believe it was the other day, stating, uh, from the time that they launched online only exemption, they've had about 23,000 registrations. So that's been you know, a great way for New York residents to get certified prior to turkey season, uh, which starts here in just a couple of days. Um, and then states like Nevada, you know, like Nevada is up almost 3x right now. Um, and, and they've been online only, but it was one of those things where, you know, lowered the, the minimum age to give their residents and options. So that's just kind of what we're seeing. Um, the, the last note that I have here that's kind of intriguing is that we have seen an increase in, in um, customer acquisition through kind of search terms around food acquisition. Right? And we don't know if that's just a normal trend or if it is COVID related, but uh, that's one thing that we found kind of interesting is we're seeing more traffic coming from people you know, who are searching for, you know, how do I go out and, and uh, grow or, you know, take, take my own food. So pretty interesting stuff. And happy to field any questions that, that might have come up. Thank you, Mitch. Appreciate that. Um, I know in the New York example, and I see some folks on the, the call from New York in the chat box, it, the 23,000 was just since the onset of the course. That was like in less than a month's time, right? 
Yeah, that was about two weeks ago, um, two and a half maybe, uh, April 13th, I believe, is when we launched. But the, the one thing I, I left out and that was really important in New York is that we have to maintain educational integrity through this, right? So adding that virtual field day is something that we kind of as, as a vendor and, and with our state partners have done. So in New York, people take the online course that's always been available to them, but in addition, they have to take that virtual field day. And yeah, since the launch on April 13th, it's, it's now over 24,000 registrations. And that is rivaling, uh, I forget the complete volume they did, but that was a pretty large percent of the volume of uh, participants that went through Hunter Ed in their state, based on the reports that people have been sharing with us just via email. And so the concept here is that um, we have a ton of people coming into Hunter Ed, potentially, and we're trying to find the right metrics. So if you're sitting on the call and you're thinking about it, now's a great time to just check in with your Hunter Ed coordinator or if you're the Hunter Ed folks, uh, check in with your R3 coordinator and see where you are in, in regards to previously. Are you higher? Are you lower? Are they different types of people? Whatever data you have available to help kind of see who's coming to the table, it's helpful to understand those target audiences. Um, I know Rob Southwick, I asked him to be on here um, for a second because we did a study back in 2013. In, in 2011 to 2013, I believe. Yeah, uh, and it was called, it's basically the proclivity of Hunter Education students, graduates, to take, uh, to go on and buy a hunting license. And the data is here. Um, I do believe they're updating this project. So here's one opportunity you can walk away with here. If you're on here and you want to like, study your Hunter Ed grad a little bit more. But Rob, are you able to chat and expand on the, the study that occurred and what we learned from it? But then yeah, also yeah, the opportunity that's before us. Can you hear me this time? We can, yeah. All right, because yeah, I went on the phone last time. and Well, first of all, we're going to change the name of the study. We took a lot of ribbing for having the word proclivity in this, the title last time. Um, but it's just that. It's, the study was launched at the request of some of the states who were wondering about the high rate of Hunter Ed grads that we did not identify as going back and buying a license. That's the first thing we did. We saw a massive number. Don't ask me to quote off the top of my head, and it may have changed anyway since we're redoing it. But there was you know, a majority of Hunter Ed grads that never bought a hunting license. Then those that did buy a hunting license, within three years, most of them disappeared, never came back as a hunter. And those, of course, only looking at those who were of age requiring a license. And so there's a lot of questions. We're, we're bringing all these new customers into our store. If you want to call hunting a retail store, we have Hunter Ed where we were channeling people into hunting. They walk in, they look around, and they never come back. And so what we want to do is find out what is it they're not liking, what is it they're failing to receive from the experience from hunting, and what can we do as a community to keep them engaged to have a better retention among these new hunters. So we're going to need about at least eight states to work with to survey Hunter Ed grads. So if any states are interested in being a part of it, because we need to access their Hunter Ed graduation list and their license data, we sure love to have everybody involved. We need eight states from across the region, two, two across the country, two per region, so we would um, sure love to have state involvement so we can share, share the results with everybody else probably a little bit less than a year's time from now. Awesome. And I think at one point the results of that study had shown that within six years, less than a third or around a third of Hunter Ed grads were still buying licenses. Is that fair? That's fair, yes. Yeah. So that means that they passed Hunter Ed once. They passed Hunter Ed and they bought a license once in six years, but then we lost them. We didn't retain them as a participant. We didn't keep them in the store like Rob was did. And so from they a marketing have, standpoint, but it's key to yeah, a marketing yeah. standpoint, it's easier to talk to people who have already shown an interest in your product. Instead of us going out and trying to recruit people from scratch, we have this huge base of people who have expressed interest, and we're losing them. So, and it, they should be easier, lower cost grab. So we really want to try to focus on this group. And this is a project we're doing with the Sportsman's Alliance. So I'd sure love to have some states participate. No, I'll be quiet. Thank you. No, appreciate it. And so from that perspective, um, Nick had mentioned that, you know, the trends of where people are coming from that are searching for Hunter Ed courses might be changing too. So if they're coming into it because maybe 
COVID-19 has rocked their interest and they said, I want to be a little bit more self-reliant. Maybe that's what's motivating them right now. Um, how can we learn about them and how can we keep them engaged in hunting moving forward? That's a conversation point. Um, I'm glad Rob brought up the idea of marketing. So when we talk about retention, um, we have this perspective that it's hard. There's different types of retention that we can do. One of the greatest successes we've had so far has been with marketing strategies. And now I know Jennifer was new she's on the call, and so is Jack Rob from Nevada. And, and Jack, we're going to ask you to share some of the examples. I believe you guys have a 365 license that you put into place. You guys have done some different things with your licensing that have really helped you guys to see a return on your at strategies. Could you share a little bit about that? Yes, Nevada, we've uh, been lucky in uh, getting some growth. Not lucky, it's been calculated growth. But I'm going to circle back to the Hunter Ed uh, before I go forward on some of our growth. We went to online Hunter Ed last year for 21 and older people. And we saw tremendous growth as a result of that in a couple age groups. And the age group I was looking for growth in was the 11 to 15-year-old group. And I've only been at the agency for five years. And when I came to the agency, our Hunter Ed group was measuring success a lot of times on full classes. Well, we had X number of classes, and they were all full. Well, if your classes are full, how many people couldn't get in? And so we made Hunter Ed online available to anybody 21 and older. And what that did was open up the ability to get more youth in with the same number of classes offered and uh, try not to have full classes every time. By doing that, from 2018 to 2019, we had a 55% growth in that 11 to 15-year-old age group uh, because people 21 to 30 years old, uh, if they can't do it on their phone or do it online, they're probably not going to do it. Uh, 21 to 25, we had a 12% growth, and 26 to 30, we had a 10% growth in those age groups in customers, not just in Hunter Ed, but in customers. So uh, I see Hunter Ed as being a barrier to participation in a lot of ways. And you have to figure out ways to take down those barriers to participation. Uh, he also brought up we went to a 365 license. Uh, that enables us, we used to have a, a license year. It wasn't a calendar year, and it wasn't a fiscal year. Our, our license year ended end of February was the beginning of March being a new license year. Uh, by going to 365, we're able to market December, January, February in ways we never could. And our growth in those months is tremendous. Uh, so that, that's the key, being able to market, because we couldn't market in those months before due to the fact that you're marketing something that's going to be good for a month or two, and people aren't going to buy it. Now you're selling something that's good for 12 months. And, and we're seeing uh, tremendous growth in those months compared to years prior. Uh, the other thing we've done, when we went live with Galcomai, it was a new system. Uh, this is our third cycle with them. Uh, we made everybody claim their new account in the new system, and we required an email address as part of their sign-on. So uh, we're in the middle of our big game application period now. It's open for seven weeks. We make approximately 75% of our annual revenue in this seven weeks. This is where we sell licenses, take big game application fees and everything. So it's a it's a it's our money time of the year. But the number of emails we're sending out during this time is tremendous. We're sending out an email to people that participated in 2018 that didn't participate in 2019. That email is going out today. So we're doing targeted marketing. Uh, different strategies. Uh, people a lot of times don't have a home phone number anymore. When we, when they claim their new account, they had to put in a new phone number. We have cell numbers now. Last Friday, we sent out a cell reminder that the big M application period is going. This Friday, we're going to send out a text message that it, the big M application period closes May 4th. When we send those out, you can see immediate response uh, to that type of outreach. So. Uh, between 365 license, uh, auto renew, that was another key component of our growth. 
our, our churn rate was bigger than we like. It's still bigger than we like. But the more people we get on auto renew, uh, a lot of people, they just, what we're finding is if it was in their pocket and they had two hours, they may go fishing. But if it wasn't in their pocket and they had two hours, they found a different activity to do because they didn't have time to run to Walmart or run to a licensing agent or somebody to get that license. But they had the two, you know, if it was already in their pocket, they'd go. The other thing we did, we made our license available on the phone. We call it get online, get outside. You can buy your license and display it in the field to a game warden on your phone. So if you're out recreating with other friends and they happen to be fishing, you don't need to go to a store to get a license. You can say, hey, I want to buy my license right now, buy it, and it's good immediately, and you can display it to the game warden when he when he pulls up. So uh, we've put in a lot of things, and it, it's really paid off in uh, customer retention, customer recruitment. Uh, and we are reactivating customers because we're chasing them. And like I said, people that participate in 2018 didn't, didn't in 19. We're chasing them specifically today. Uh, so we've, we've taken a lot of approaches, and then you can't look for one to fix everything. You need to look at a whole suite of things, and, and that's what we've done in Nevada. And thank you for those insights. Um, we had a question regarding that. Uh, Aaron Hirschberger from Nebraska asked, are there 355 licenses connected or not connected with the automatic renewal? Connected. 100% connected. Okay, connected. Connected. okay, that makes and, sense. And, and, and during this COVID time, we're seeing things we never, you know, we're pushing our big game application period because that's a fall activity for us. We are not pushing fishing right now because our governor has a stay-at-home order. I'm actually sitting in my house on this call today. So we have made a conscious effort not to push fishing because we don't want to be in conflict with our governor's order to stay at home. But in the month okay. of April, we see a 57% increase in fishing license sales without us pushing a bit. But we are getting people that are signing up for auto renew. We are getting email addresses. We're getting things that we can chase those customers in the future. So it's about the relationship side of it. And a lot of the tactics you've taken haven't been programmatic in style. They've been marketing and communication approaches. Um, and a lot of research on the angling side has helped to demonstrate the power of this. And our partners and our licensing divisions have, have brought the technology to the table to implement these. Um, that's been a great opportunity of growth we've seen in kind of the market and a tactic we can apply for retention. I know a colleague of yours that has done a lot of um, marketing approaches to increase retention as their strategy has been Jennifer Wisniewski. And Jennifer, I see you posted that you have a 30%, 38% uh, churn rate for residents, and you shared some of your tactics up in how your agency has approached retention efforts. So could you just kind of expand upon what you guys have done? I think you have 365. Are there some other tactics that you have done along the way too? Um, that you can uh, well, that you've seen effective? Sure. Um, we are not 365. We have a license year. So March 1st was Ooh, the sorry. first day of our new license year. Um, we do a whole lot to make sure that we are focused in on retention and reactivation because I feel like the whole community recruits. Everybody on this call has some sort of dealings in recruiting, but once the agency gets all the personal information off of that customer, we should be able to retain and or reactivate those people. So, Because I know everything from where you live to what licenses you purchase to, you know, so much information. So um, we invest a lot of time and energy into retention and reactivation. And we do a lot of email and texting. Um, we, of course, offer auto renew. Um, we are a branch state, and they are the Cadillac of licensed vendors. So we are very lucky to have them as our teammate, and um, they do a bang-up job helping us with uh, digital ads. So we do ads on um, just regular online search ads as well as display ads that you might see when you're surfing the Weather Channel or um, other online hemispheres. And then there's social media ads, and um, we're even tiptoeing into uh, social influencer advertising like the Hunting Public and a couple of others. So um, we 
do a whole lot to try to not only recruit but retain and reactivate. Um, and as we came into this kind of, um, we didn't know what was going on. When we came back from the North American and everybody kind of was getting on lockdown slowly but surely, um, I, we just started sending out communications to folks saying, hey, the outdoors is open. And um, so far we've sent some emails and done some, um, we've changed up some of our uh, online advertising strategy to say, you know, get distance, go fishing, um, get outdoors, it's good for your mental and physical health those kind of messages and you know our license sales for this license year so far are up two million dollars which when you think about the non-residents that are not coming into tennessee to go turkey hunting this year or go fishing um that are those license sales are in the, the can but our residents are coming out in droves to go hunting and fishing now we will get to see if we're just making everybody buy their license sooner in the license year or later, since we don't have a 365 license um, at the end of the license year. So um, I'm really kind of excited about that. But we have absolutely actively communicated with lapsed turkey hunters, lapsed boaters, lapsed fishermen, um, all sorts of audiences to try to get um, folks reactivated. Awesome. And can you share a little bit about uh, some of the unique new industry partnerships that you've created that may oh, yes. not affect the evaluation? Yeah, so yeah. another thing that uh, we have tried starting last year um, was uh, some incentives from partners. So we partnered with Onyx Maps and offered incentives uh, to renew as well as offering a thank you message for, you know, if you purchased your license this year, we want to say thank you and here's a discount for Onyx Maps. Um, and then we did the same thing with uh, people that had uh, lapsed. So we said, okay, if you renew your license in the next two weeks, um, we'll give you a coupon for or this promo code, whatever you like to call it, um, for um, Onyx Maps. And so we were really successful with Onyx Maps and uh, Academy Sports and Outdoors, a retail partner, with getting people to renew their license that had lapsed, as well as good um, – warm fuzzies from people that had had their license and we got to send them that thank you for purchasing your license. Here's a gift. And the concept that you're talking about, um, a lot of people like have talked about the valuation of a license, right? Um, mm -hmm. Some have compared it to like a triple A card. What's my triple A card? Yeah. I get, <laughs> yeah, I get my, if I break down along the side of the road, I get my like or my tire. I get my license replaced. Yeah, that's right. I get my tire replaced and fixed. Or if I happen to run out of gasoline, they can help me out. But on top of it, I get uh, my discounts to my hotels. I get discounts to a bunch of different offers. And so a lot of our colleagues have started to say, well, if your hunting license was like a club card, and it got you discounts here, discounts there. That's essentially what you're putting into place, right, Jennifer? Uh, that's, that's the end goal is to have, okay, I save $150 a year because I buy this $75 license or whatever. So it's, it's more of an incentive, and it's good for the brand partners as well as, um, you know, for re re retention. But you know, the, the difficulties that we're having getting to the finish line on that one involve you know, are we favoring one retailer over another? Are we favoring brands over another? So there's um, some certain things that we have to overcome because we don't want to offer 100,000 different discounts because then it's, um, you know, overload. But um, we're hoping to find a sweet spot and get, get, get something started. Awesome. And I know um, as we have a conversation here, I just want to kind of mention there's two points of, like, retention and why we're trying to talk about we want to retain more hunters, right? We have churn, and that is something we can directly impact by keeping them more active. So um, all the strategies we're sharing are a lot in the pilot stage. Um, a lot of this has come on in the last five years, and so now is a chance, like our, our the council's executive board last year, now is a chance to innovate right now um, with our three efforts and stuff. So if you have an idea, go ahead and try it. But make sure you're evaluating, too, and make sure you know you have control groups and everything to see what works and what doesn't. Um, so sorry, Jennifer, about not uh, confusing your 365 license. Um, forgot that you guys didn't have it. Did you have it in Georgia, though? 
Yes, we did have it in Georgia, but I'm full-blown Tennessee okay. now. Correct. Of hardcore Tennessee, and that's correct. Okay. Um, and so when we talk about marketing strategies, uh, those are newer, as I mentioned. Um, we did have a project. Okay, well, before I hop to that, um, there are some other strategies that I kind of wanted to share um, about lapsing and testing ideas out. And as an example, Corin Jagnow from the Pennsylvania Game Gaming Commission, are you on? I am. Awesome. Um, when you first joined the Game Commission, you did a project, and you piloted it, and you found some results. Uh, could you help us understand what you did and kind of the perspective and maybe go into some of the focus groups you've done too? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so we've done a lot of work with Lapse Hunters. I've always been very interested, and I think that Rob brought up, uh, Rob Southwick brought up a really good point that these are people that have already expressed interest. You know, whoever they are, these are people that have bought licenses that this, to me, makes a lot of sense. And so we uh, had just that first year that I started the Game Commission, it was finishing up our first year of automated licenses. So for the first time, we were able to see who our lapsing hunters were. And so we had taken people who had purchased the year before by a certain deadline that we had established. It was like October 31st, something like that. And those that hadn't purchased yet, we went and sent them a postcard. And we came up with two ideas for postcards, so different messages, and then we had a control group. And we sent the first one, and we did see that people maybe bought soon after getting it, but it really at the end of our test period we didn't find any difference between our test groups and our control group. So people may have bought sooner from re receiving the postcard, but overall they did not purchase more frequently. Now, we haven't really gone back to this idea, not to say that I think that it's over. I think we didn't have really the capacity to do message testing, and we just wanted to kind of give it a try because I know that boating has had some luck with this. We just didn't, but that doesn't mean I think that we abandon it. But I think a really important part of this is that we did see some activity after it, but when compared to a control group, it didn't show us anything. So I think that Samantha just mentioned the idea of a control group. I think that's really important because we weren't sure if like one message would resonate more than another, and I don't think we saw that either. It's been quite a long time since we've done this, but we do focus groups of hunters all the time. and. Really, uh, most recently, we uh, had a, a regulation change in Pennsylvania. So for many years, we had a sun, excuse me, a Monday opener for our general firearms deer season. Very, very popular day. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people go hunting that day. Uh, the, the public schools are off. I mean, my whole life uh, growing up in Pennsylvania, I never went to school on the Monday after Thanksgiving, and I'm sure all the other people on this call from Pennsylvania, including Samantha Petter, has never really gone to uh, regular school, maybe college, but not uh, K through 12 on the Monday after Thanksgiving. And they, for the first time this year, they changed it to a Saturday. It was just like there's too many people who have jobs who can't get off work. College kids was one of the reasons that was mentioned by one of our commissioners. So before this was legal, because we didn't know if the reg change would go through, because it was wildly unpopular with some of our more established hunters. And we did a, a survey and said, if there was a Saturday opener, this was to lapse hunters, a lapse hunter survey, would you start hunting? And we gave them the option of, I would definitely start hunting, I might start hunting, or no, it's not going to make me start hunting, or buy, buying a license again. So what we did is we took a look again after this was made legal this year as of, I think, December 31st to see what these people did. And about 24% of the people who said that they would definitely buy a license if it became legal did buy one. So much lower than one would expect if someone said they're definitely going to do something, but still it was much, much higher than any of the other groups. Uh, so what we did was we did a focus group of these lap hunters who said they would buy but then didn't end up doing it. And they basically were like, just life happened to them. They couldn't get there. You know, that they wanted to hunt. It wasn't that they weren't telling the truth, but they, some of these people had financial difficulties. Some, one man that w they were interviewed, he had – um, he had sold all his hunting equipment when he had a child born, and he didn't have the money to buy it back by the time it was hunting season. I mean, some really, really, you know, compelling reasons for people to not hunt. But we do them all the time, and, and really consistently what we see in our lapse hunter research is you know, the lack of time, that it's something that people still enjoy. They don't consider themselves ex-hunters 
with very few exceptions, do they consider themselves ex hunters. Most of these people are just taking a break, and when they either can go with people they want to go to, but usually when they have the time, when their you know children are older and they don't have the same work commitments, and you know that's something we're trying to do and having some regs changes. And and currently, Pennsylvania has never had Sunday hunting for this upcoming fall we will have three Sundays so instead of making Sunday hunting across the board legal they have now changed it just to allow three Sundays uh, for this year so that'll be new for us too and we're hoping that just some basic rights changes to make the weekends a little more accessible to people will have an impact that's it that was a lot. And, <laughs> no that's awesome though and it, and it brings up a lot of examples the ability not all agencies have the human dimension person in place or have the chance to do focus groups. But um, I know you have had that, in, you, I mean, it comes with you, with your PhD in it. Um, but what you're seeing right now by having that continual communication with hunters is like a chance to respond to their interests. And am I correct in thinking that this year so far, license sales might be up a little bit? They are. They've been up um, about 0.5%, and that was as of January. That has nothing to do with, like, the quarantine time. Uh, we'll find out a lot more after the month is over between, you know, we have our spring turkey opener uh, is this Saturday. They had the youth season last week, but our spring turkey opener is this Saturday. So between, you know, we usually see some licenses sold, but our, our license calendar, as you know, is more like it comes available June, July, but it's really July 1 to June 30th. And we don't usually see a lot of license sales after our, you know, general firearms deer season. It's very, very minimal. But we're curious to see. If, if someone knows, I don't know. But for the year, as of, like, the end of the calendar year, we were up about a half a percent. But for us, that's great because we sometimes lose 2 or 3 percent a year. Which has been huge. And so yeah, yeah. Um, the idea about some of the themes we wanted to highlight um, in the conversation on retention is that there's different strategies organizations can take, whether it be policy, changing the opener of the season in a very culturally based state. Um, it is a challenging thing to do, but if you do it and see results, it could help um, help in the future. And, and then we have the idea of the marketing side, which we've talked a lot about. Um, one thing I wanted to not miss was how to understand what our retention rates look like. So when we talk about recruitment, we can see, oh, look, 19,000 more licenses sold. That's great. Or we lost, we lapsed um, 19,000 hunters. But another term that if people aren't familiar with about it is called churn. And we've done a ton of research on churn. Um, Rob Southwick, can you share some perspectives you did on segmentation and churn studies? back in 13 to 15, roughly? Are you there? Okay. Well, he's getting... There. Well, he's I know. Getting set. There. There we go. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. All right. Sorry. Yep, yep, talking yep. away. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, yeah, so the churn, is, we looked at that heavily. And it's just, it has been a key measure over time. And the study you mentioned is one we did for NSSF that was grant funded and about 12 states here participated on that study. And we, we appreciate that. Um, but your churn is, is just as, you know, it recognizes that there's a larger pool of customers out there. And not all of them are your customer every year. And so let's say if you have 100 customers and you have 50% churn rate, that means only half of them are buying in any given year. And our concern, of course, as state agencies is that we want to reduce this churn rate, get our hunters and our anglers to go out more often and not skip out a year. That's just scary. When they skip a year, they still have recreational time. It means they're doing something else. And so if they're skipping more often, that means something else is doing a better job of winning their interest, winning their participation. We're losing them to another activity. And so churn rate is really important in this retention. So we measure retention success by the, re the churn rate. If our retention efforts are doing well, our churn rate should be going down. Dashboards help us measure that and all that. So on the hunting side, um, that study you mentioned um, about five years ago, uh, we found that hunters, typically about 22, 25 percent of hunters nationally, um, will not buy a license the next year. And it doesn't really change that much across the country. 
Um, but it doesn't sound too bad. Okay, so we're losing one out of four every year, and then maybe they'll come back, maybe they won't. But when you step back and look at it, at five years, it's over half of them won't buy a license in five straight years. So that means, you know, during at least one of those years, if not four, a lot of these folks are planning something else to do. When you step back further and look at a 10-year period, only about 10 to 15 percent will buy a license in 10 straight years. And that's been, that was kind of eye-opening at the time because I always thought that, hey, if you hunt, you hunt. That's what your lifestyle. You do it every year. And that's a common fallacy we've had as agencies that we look in the mirror and say, hey, that person there is the average hunter. And that's not true because we're reminded by it daily at work. We think about it. We plan ahead. And most of our customers, they don't. Um, Corn was saying about her, her research there in Pennsylvania. I could not agree any more um, with her, what, what she's saying. She's absolutely right on. We've seen that too. Is that people often, uh, life gets in the way. And they'll tell you that in a survey. It's like, I don't have time. And that's not really an answer. That's a symptom. What it means is something else took their time. Something else gave them better happy factor for their time that they're out there. Maybe is more um, valuable. You know, they had more satisfaction for the money spent. But in most cases, when you dig down into it, it comes down to someone saying, I want to do something different. And so maybe you want to go hunting, but your good buddy says, hey, man, let's go. Let's do that kayak trip. And you don't take the guns with you. Um, or it could be a camping trip. Usually it's another outdoor activity. That's so what we've seen what competes with, with hunting. So the, the churn rate is, is huge. And some things will affect it. The economy actually helps, helps us reduce the churn rate. People have more time on their hands. And we're hearing from some states that you know, license sales are up when they're not in mandatory shutdowns. Non-resident dependent states are having a rougher go. But right now we've got a lot of people getting out there who would have dropped out because they would have been working overtime, but they're not doing that now. So our trick in retention this year is reminding them how much fun they had, getting folks who have left to get out there. Um, so I'll, I'll shut up here, but that's kind of the you know quick soapbox on a very big, broad topic of churn rate. And we do have some reports that are out there, and more of it coming out later okay. probably. So yeah, I'll and thank you. Right and the concept of it, yeah, the concept of churn um, is one. I remember. When we first started talking about it, when I worked for the uh, PA Game Commission, we had a ton of people in the license database, like 1.5 million at the time. But we sold like 950,000 licenses. And that was my first exposure to churn itself, right? That the people in the database aren't always buying every year. And um, I encourage folks in your agencies and your organizations too, because membership and nonprofits and customers, of course, of uh, industry partners, they churn as well. So look at it. Um, some of the factors that we knew um, about churn, and Rob, I have some of the studies pulled up. We know that men and women churn differently. Women have a higher churn rate than men. We know that across the different types of um, hunters, from suburban, urban, or rural, you know, rural has a lower churn rate than urban people. And that makes logical sense to us. But when you start to look at your license sales and where people fall in your state, Look at it from that perspective and see what those rates are for your organization or for your agencies. And maybe there's some different tactics you can take to retain them in different approaches. And so there's a lot of great studies here. Um, Rob, a lot of the work that was done on churn was pre-marketing tactics, in, um, at least on the hunting side, right? right excuse you pre, I missed that last part there. Hitting the mute button. Like, Pre, uh, before a lot of like other strategies we have with marketing and everything that we're doing now with auto renew, right. 365 email, that was all beforehand, correct? Correct, absolutely, yeah. Okay. So we hope so that turn rates improve have, because of that. Exactly, and we can watch it over time for sure. And um, so I, I did want to point out one question um, that somebody mentioned. Um, Ellen said, I'm a landowner in Kentucky. I don't always need to buy a license. I buy one when I think I have a chance to hunt somewhere else. So I don't buy every year, but I still hunt every year. And here comes one of the big factors of state-by-state -state options. Um, some states have exactly this. They have a landowner option where if they own the land, then uh, they can just hunt there. So they might be hunting, but they're not showing up in your database. Unfortunately, there's really you got to know what's going on in your state, and then we have to consider like regional and national trends too to get a hardcore understanding of retention efforts and churn in your state. So those are great points to pull out. Every state's different. That's one of the only things we can count on in R3 efforts. 
And so um, consider what's going on in your own state and factor that into when you're calculating your current effort. Um, Rob, we did get one question just since you're here. It looks like you're typing, but if you want to answer it too, it's from Zach Thomas from Texas Parks and Wildlife. And he's asking, do other outdoor activities pull attention away from anglers in the same way that it does for hunters, like you mentioned? Yes, thanks. I'll just start typing a response back there to That's that. Okay. Um, so, um, yes, it's really the factors why we lose hunters and anglers don't really vary between the two activities. We've done a lot of great research at RBFF, and they have other research, too, on the angler side. And you see the same reasons come up all the time. It's, you know, people say uh, their friends are wanting to do other other activities. The only really difference between hunting and, and fishing is that hunting has a lower churn rate, and we think that's because if you hunt, you're more invested. You've taken hunter ed, you've put more money into equipment, and primarily the difficulty in accessing land. Either you can get out or you can't. But that's really the only difference. So the motivations, the reasoning is very similar across or both, and I do believe there's some strong opportunity for some cross-marketing. It's not go hunting or go fishing. It's make sure next year you go hunting and fishing because a lot of our customers do both. And what we're learning, um, like there was a report from Vermont uh, written by a fisheries biologist in the Outdoor Wire yesterday that said Vermont license sales are up. Fishing is at a higher rate than ever. Um, if that means more people are outdoors right now, what does that mean uh, that we can bring them into the season for the full summertime and maybe get them heading to the woods for the fall as well too? So the cross-marketing potential here with the, imagine a funnel. And the top of the funnel is the number of people who go outdoors. It seems like that number, while we're trying to find statistics and estimates on it, it seems that anecdotally that number is huge. And when we start to talk about the different types of activities that take resources to participate, you know, fishing's there, then hunting, boating somewhere in there too, we start to whittle down the amount of people interested in it. But if we think about if the funnel overall of people interested in the outdoors gets bigger for everywhere, that means the pool of people who are already outdoors and experiencing it is bigger, and the chance to bring more people into hunting, angling, or any other activity is also greater. So is we have one, this one kind of, point. Yeah. I'm, not, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, you know, my, my nature, I tend to cut in, so tell me to... You're fine. Not, but um, the motivations, Zach's question, that doesn't vary a whole lot between wanting to fish, wanting to hunt, and why they don't go. But getting back into hunting is more of a challenge. It requires more hand-holding than it does for anglers because of the access issue, a place to go, the regulations, the hunter ed. And so while we can get their attention through good marketing, it's going to take a little bit more intense hand-holding, one-on-one, and help to get them into the hunting shooting side. And that's where the states have to be careful. So the messaging to get their attention could be the same campaign, cross campaigns, but they might need a little more intense hand-holding on the hunting side. I'll hit the mute button again. No, that's awesome. Really appreciate it. Um, and that kind of goes into another point we wanted to bring up, because we talked about marketing strategies. We talked about um, control groups and churn rates. Um, but if we look at it programmatically, uh, we do a lot of R3 programs to do introductory hunts and to do recruitment efforts. We can do programs for retention efforts, um, whether that be in person or the new style is electronically. And Mitch, I know you had mentioned the turkey hunting 101 and the deer hunting 101, but the idea of increasing a hunter's avidity and taking um, you know, an introductory hunter and teaching them how to turkey hunt gets them outside more and just kind of increases their ability, which we know increases their ability to be retained as a hunter. So can you kind of explain the courses you have just a little bit more detail and how they came about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing is that, you know, states have done a really good job of offering workshops. Um, you know, whether that's how to field dress certain game or you know, whatever the workshop might be, and those have always been very popular post Hunter Ed. Um, the reason that we started getting into the online delivery of this is we've had, you know, as more and more states go online only, we saw a direct response from our students kind of saying, hey, you know, what's next? What do I, where do I go to learn this? Where do I go to learn that? And a lot of times we would, you know, drive them to the workshops or drive them to YouTube, and what we heard there was, well, how do I know if if I can trust what's on YouTube, 
you know, there's so much there, how do I know it's trustworthy? And that's where, you know, the obvious choice in our partners with like the NGO groups to form those classes really paid off because we have that trustworthy information to deliver to those folks. Um, but we're definitely seeing an appetite for more, you know, beyond the basics of just Species 101, um, you know, how to sight in a rifle, um, shotgun shooting techniques. I mean, I think there there's definitely an appetite for that kind of information that we, you know, as a community uh, could tap into and, and really provide, you know, more, more courses and resources for them. So ho hope that kind of helps answer your question there. It has. It definitely has. Um, we're starting to see a lot of our partners, a great program to take a look at is the Illinois Learn to Hunt series. Um, I know Dan Stevens has transitioned a lot of their courses to online as well and done like Learn to Duck Hunt, Learn to Deer Hunt. Um, Modern Carnivore with Mark Norquist has gone online for some of his offering too. And um, they're a little bit different than the hunt, like the education courses. They're more so like Facebook Live style events. But the different styles of content and offering for increased learning of content and diversifying their hunting experiences, I think, plays into keeping them more active for the long run. Um, I did want to yeah, point it, out it that also Rob, present. Prese oh, oh, go ahead. No, no. It just presents a unique. It one thing we are seeing is it pre presents a unique opportunity to cross promote. That's the one thing that you know I would ask states to think about too is if. If somebody does come into a Deer 101 workshop, like don't be scared to tell them about all of your other workshops because we are seeing, you know, uh, some of those people go from one course to the other. So there seems to be a higher conversion rate in that kind of continued education cross-marketing. Um, so that that's definitely something for states to be thinking about too as you're hosting workshops, you know, whether those are webinars or in person, you know, what have you. Just cross-promote everything that you have and the hope is that somebody who wouldn't have gone turkey hunting before, now they will because they learn more about it and they've, they've built the knowledge and the confidence they need to go do that. That's an awesome point. Thank you for that. Um, and we, Corin, you have worked a little bit on Avidity as well, correct? Yes. Oh, I did a couple of surveys a few years back and I did one of people I was calling casual hunters, so people who bought one, two, or three out of five possible years, so 20 to 60% of the time, and then another survey of people who bought four or five out of five years, so the 80 or 100% purchasers. And we've, we can even look at, we had some dashboards that we were briefly using through Penn State, and we were seeing some different things. Of even just the people who buy 100% of the time are really almost more different than all the other groups are. We see our, uh, more avid hunters buy early in the year. So the, the people who buy when our, you know, licenses first go on sale uh, in anticipation of getting an antlerless tag that they have to apply for early, those are people who buy every year. They're people who usually grow up in hunting families, and that's a tough thing for us to replicate. You know, that that's the harder part of that. But I think one of the things we try to focus on is maybe getting people involved in multiple seasons each year instead of having everything hinging upon going for that uh, general firearms deer season, you know, that first day that people go, and if they can't make that, then usually most of the hunting year is over. You know, we want to get people out. We want to get them involved in the small game or even getting their antlerless tags or in archery season, and knowing that the earlier they purchase, the more kinds of uh, hunting they can participate in, but then also not having it all just hinging on okay, well, the weather was bad or I didn't get access or whatever else may have happened. You know, I had a conflict that weekend, uh, is, which was right after Thanksgiving, uh, that we had general firearms deer season. That One of the things I, I like to do focus groups even of people who are late purchasers to kind of get the thought process of, you know, what has to happen for those people to buy versus those who buy earlier. Yeah, and that's huge. I remember looking at the stats with you and – so the number of sales that occurred over the opening weekend of deer season, like leading up to when it was a Monday opener, really was a revolutionary kind of perspective to have because and that means people are literally like Friday night after Thanksgiving saying, I think I'm going to go deer hunting. And to, you know, the, a lot of us who in this field hunt often or, or do activities frequently outdoors, we don't think of it being as opp opportunistic. But that is a case out there. There's a segment of hunters. So... 
understanding that more and keeping those things in mind helps us to retain them for the long run. Uh -huh. Yes. So and thank even, you for those questions. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting we just found this year was with this Saturday opener, I was looking at those people who purchased that day before. So when I was talking about our analyst year season, it's always like that Thanksgiving weekend is where this happens. So typically um, what it was was the Monday after Thanksgiving was the opener. This year it was the, just two days after Thanksgiving. So there's that Black Friday in between the uh, Thanksgiving and then the opener for deer season. And tons of people bought that day, tons. And we saw among people, there were people who were seven or eight years lapsed who came back to buy. And for example, like some of the people who had been lapsed for four years, 15 or 14 or 15 percent of those people who were lapsed for four years who became reactivated bought on that single day before. So we see a lot of that. And I think if we can, you know, just sort of say, hey, look, you know, you can go archery deer hunting too. You know, this doesn't have to be firearms deer season, you know, and then of course we have, you know, opportunity to use crossbows. And so I think that just learning a lot about them and, you know, just really, really basic um, analytics to get from a, you know, our automated license, but we couldn't do that for years. I mean, we really only had about 10 years of uh, automated data from these. So, so it, it's, it's something that's been a game changer, but it really is always fascinating to me. Uh, especially the how much people buy late, but those are definitely our less avid hunters are buying later in the year. So I think like the timing of purchase is maybe something I don't hear a lot about, but i am always been really fascinated by that. Yeah, it's definitely something that um, even if you can't get trend, a bunch of data from your license sales, look at when people are buying, look for your bumps, and look at what retention from messaging you might have there and opportunities in that regard. Um, I know we're coming up on the 3 o'clock hour. As you can tell, uh, this is something I'm super interested in for retention efforts. Um, we know we have lots of room to grow here as a community of practitioners. Um, and why not now when more people are taking to the outdoors? We've pretty much covered a bunch of different topics as well, too, and, and just grade them. Um, if there's any conversation points you want to bring up, we could do another coffee hour about this a little later. I'm, we've gathered a couple papers that you guys can read, and we'll start to publish those and get the right permission so you guys can have access to it. But if there's any kind of questions, you can type them in real quick. Um, I think we've covered everything else for right now. So in the essence of time, and if you don't see anyone else posting, this was your primer on retention. We started the conversation. COVID-19 has presented an opportunity. In the words of our leadership, now is the time to innovate. R3 was designed for just this time. Let's take a chance and try some ideas there. The R3 community stands for your comments and conversation points. We've seen some increase in, in conversation over the last couple of weeks, so I encourage you to check it out. And join us next week for our next coffee hour. If you have any questions, I'll put my email here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you to everyone that participated, Mitch, Jack, Rob, Cora, and Jennifer. Thank you guys so much. And